Thank you very much. Thank you all for coming. So it's a great pleasure to be able to share with you some recent knowledge on uh, how sex hormones shape brain function and how brain, our brains integrate sexual uh, sex hormone information and how that uh, can be done in healthy and unhealthy manners and what that might mean for uh, opportunities to protect mental health. In my talk, uh, I'll cover basic aspects on biology of hormones and brain and illustrate to you how hormonal transitions might be associated with mental health and also show uh, and provide some perspectives uh, of how understanding such associations may uh, help us uh, develop personalized prevention of depressive episodes and uh, maybe also point to novel targets and treatments for depressive episodes. So how does, does uh, um, sexual or female hormones work? So these are steroid hormones and they work uh, at the very center of, of our cells. And here I illustrated some of the really potent effects that steroid hormones can have, can drive uh, fetal growth and rebuilding mother's body and brain through pregnancy, also when used in artificial ways, uh, can really potently affect our body that is quite clearly illustrated here. And the mechanisms of actions are, as I said, that steroid hormones travel all the way to the very inner part of the cell, the cell nucleus, where it can uh, bind in complexes with the coat that the cell uses uh, to, 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 to do its work, and it can affect how the cell uses that uh, DNA coat. Uh, also, there are uh, membrane-bound effects and receptors there that are less uh, prominent, but can also uh, direct faster actions and direct the membrane trafficking of proteins that can also, in faster ways, uh, affect how the cell works. So these are really profound effects that those hormones can have. Uh, hormonal systems or hormonal rhythms are governed by the brain and is integrated, uh, uh, the integrated associations between brain and such systems. Um, they're classically governed by what we call a neuroendocrine axis, which is the system that at the level of the brain, the hypothalamus, trophic or governing hormones can be released uh, to stimulate a very centrally placed gland called the pituitary gland. That can yet again uh, release other trophic or managing hormones to uh, uh, stimulate uh, the end organs, in case of a woman, the ovaries, to produce uh, sex hormones, which uh, um, the most... Um, the prominent ones are estradiol and progesterone in case of a woman. And this system is um, under negative inhibitory feedback uh, regulation, so it can produce these uh, sustained rhythmic uh, uh, patterns of release. So we may think of um, the brain's way to contact and govern bodily functions and maybe also integrating and adapting to environmental changes as something that is very wired. But you can see here with hormone systems and how the brain can kind of have this unwired extended arm and can regulate uh, bodily functions and also can help and support how we can be in contact with environment and integrate and adapt to such information. So this is my first example of how uh, female hormones, in this case the very potent hormone estradiol, which is an estrogen, uh, can actually drive uh, uh, structural brain changes. So this is something we didn't know until quite recently, that uh, actually brain structure, which is, which is maybe more thought of as a kind of a fixed thing, or something that can change in like a, you know, longer term patterns, can actually be um, changing uh, in, in, in a quite short time frame in uh, association or in a pattern that is uh, uh, synchronous with estradiol changes. So in this study, the researchers, they were scanning uh, one woman tons of time across the menstrual cycle and utilized then the subtle hormonal fluctuations that, that, uh, that we experience through a menstrual cycle and showed that uh, a, a, a very important structure in the brain called hippocampus was changing its microstructure um, in a similar pattern uh, to estradiol changes. Uh, and this part of the brain is, uh, is we can think of as, 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 as a marker of brain plasticity because it's known to be, uh, has to be very plastic and has to uh, help us adapt uh, to environment and is also affected quite severely in depressed states. So that was important knowledge. And here is another system that is also um, 
built to be sensitive to hormone changes. This is called the serotonin um, neurotransmitter uh, or uh, internal communication system of the brain. And uh, in this system, it consists of a specialized set of cells that has its uh, core here. So the neuronal bodies are embedded here deeply in the brain stem and can uh, extend to the whole brain and help uh, the brain uh, to work in an organized and healthy manner uh, through these projections. So you can imagine a brain here consists of approximately 100 billion of cells that needs to, to work together in a, in a healthy manner. So, so some internal organization is really, really crucial. And that is what this uh, type of system is helping with. Um, and and uh, the red triangles and the, and the black dots uh, illustrate where there, are tar where there are receptors for hormones. So this system really listens to hormonal information. The system functions, uh, um, I'll illustrate here. So the system governs uh, many um, normal functions that are known to be uh, profoundly affected in depressed states. And this is one of the reasons why we are quite interested in it uh, in the context of depression. And also antidepressant medicine often, very often targets this system. So it's involved in appetite, sleep, mood, anxiety, aggression, impulsivity or impulse control and also stress regulation um, and sexual interest or libido. So these are all domains of human function that is uh, severely affected in depressive states. So this is one reason why we've been quite interested in this system, also not trying to understand how uh, sex hormones may affect uh, mechanisms that can be important for depressive episodes. So this is a diagram where I wanted to illustrate to you um, some of the parts of the system that we have been studying. So. Um, so you can imagine that uh, this, this is a, 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 a signaling cell. It is a serotonergic cell that sends a signal, signal to this cell. So it kind of uh, uh, spits out serotonin or signaling su substances that can be uh, sensed uh, by, by this receiving cell at, at different uh, receptors. That's one very important molecule here. Then that, that is what we have been studying quite a lot. It is called the serotonin transporter. It is this yellow cigar. And you can think of it as a kind of a break in the system because it's the single molecule that regulates uh, the levels of uh, uh, serotonin or signaling substance here and can help uh, uh, terminate, um, terminate signaling. So it's a kind of, we can think of it a little bit as a break on the serotonin um, internally organizing system that the brain has. To study this system, we need specialized uh, brain image, imaging methods that are called uh, positron emission tomography method, methods, or PET. And it's clearly illustrated here in the more orange part of, uh, of the slide that uh, we can, by introducing selective probes or tracer substances that are radio labeled uh, with very short lived uh, isotopes that can be sensed with a PET camera. We can, we can get uh, information enough to create uh, an image like this, uh, which uh, can then show us uh, the core of the uh, serotonin system, as you can see here. It's called the Rafa nuclei, but also can uh, um, image uh, the projection areas, which are very important for brain function. And that's something that we cannot uh, uh, get any clue of by looking at structural uh, MRI um, images. Okay. So, uh, being a woman. So there are undoubt undoubtedly very many great assets to being a woman, but there's also some intriguing and um, quite disturbing uh, uh, facts uh, that we need to acknowledge. So, women do uh, undergo um, hormonal transitions uh, in other ways than men, men do. Um, not through the whole life, but uh, of course men and women share puberty, but then in reproductive years, women undergo uh, uh, quite... Um, much stronger uh, uh, hormone fluctuations. And uh, some of the facts that, uh, that, that I've been uh, trying to address is that there's an increased risk of depression which is twofold uh, uh, higher than men, and that this disparity between sexes actually starts from puberty and is most prominent across these reproductive years. So I've tried to put on the agenda for the last 10 years research que questions dealing with why, and also trying to, to look at the biological mechanisms that may underlie or may contribute to, to this increased risk of depressive episodes. And it hasn't been really easy always to put this question on the agenda for many good reasons. So, um, of course, this idea 
that women per nature should be more prone to become insane is, is, is for sure uh, very provocative. It's also provoking to me. And, uh, and that's uh, easy to illustrate because it has also taken bizarre shapes uh, if you look at it in a historical perspective. So maybe some of you know of Jean-Martin Charcot. He was a very famous uh, neuroscientist um, and uh, has also contributed importantly. He has uh, de defined many uh, still valid disease entities such as multiple sclerosis. But he also devoted some uh, maybe less... Um, um, uh, a uh, fancy part of his career to studying uh, a phenomenon he called hysteria. So he believed that uh, almost half, or like, actually he believed that half of uh, women in Paris at his time was suffering from, from these hysterical attacks. And uh, he actually started an, an, an epidemic about it. And he was uh, studying these phenomena and he was really carefully drawing them, as you see here, photographing these phenomena. Uh, he was uh, drawing maps of histogenic zones where certain points could either elicit or maybe terminate, it wasn't really clear, uh, these attacks. And also he developed the ovary compressor as some kind of a treatment tool. Uh, he poses here as Napoleon, uh, uh, I think. And you also see a closer image of his favorite patient, Blanche, who actually fully recovered when he died. So clearly... <laughs> um, Yeah, and actually later she, uh, she, she became very functional and she uh, assisted Marie Curie and also in that way contributed to science. <laughs> but um, yeah, we can laugh at that now and I, I fully share your laughs. But, but you can see how this, you know, this idea uh, has taken these very bizarre shapes and, and it's not a tradition that you, you know, necessarily want to continue. But, but, but on the other hand, I think that... Uh, that we cannot ignore the very robust epidemiological evidence that there is an increased risk of depressive episodes exactly in the phases of female life where we undergo quite heavy hormonal transitions. And one such uh, hormonal transition is the pre- to postpartum transition. And uh, that's a time where uh, depressive episodes are uh, quite frequent. The risk for hospital admission, that's of course the tip of the iceberg, but there's, you know, a lot of a lot of um, subclinical or, or, or less severe depressive episodes under, on, on, underneath that. So that risk peaks really early postpartum at around day 10 to 19, which exactly coincides with the very massive drop in sex hormone levels that are produced by placenta through pregnancy and drops with a factor of 1,000 uh, right around uh, the immediate uh, postpartum. And, uh, and, 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 and Maternal depression is not only disabling and, and it's not only the woman who suffers from it, it can also affect negatively uh, infant development, at least in the untreated states. So it's, it's extremely important if, if, if we would be able to prevent this. Also, in the most severe cases, uh, it can lead to suicide and death, uh, which is um, fortunately uh, very rare, but, but does happen, and, and you can acknowledge that it's uh, not that rare since maternal suicide is actually the leading cause of death within one year postpartum, and these are data from the UK. Um, yeah, this is just to illustrate to you, you know, on a diagram how these placenta-produced hormones, progesterone and estradiol in particular, rise through pregnancy and, and drops uh, with, a, with a really uh, heavy uh, plunge uh, at the immediate postpartum. Okay, so another uh, way to illustrate how sex hormone fluctuations may be associated with at least some variation uh, in mood and uh, depressive-like symptoms is uh, uh, PMS, or menstrual cycle uh, symptoms. But there's also a very severe form of PMS, and, 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 and that's, you know, that's not, I'm not talking about uh, being a little bit more grumpy or irritable or tired in the week before menses, or being a little bit more outward, outgoing, energetic, uh, optimistic, maybe more interested in sexual activities around ovulation. I'm talking about women who actually can have suicidal ideation, uh, being close to becoming divorced every month. Uh, so, so that is really severe uh, cases that also needs treatment, and, and it's not that rare. Uh, so. Uh, another part of a uh, um, very fluctuating part of female uh, hormonal life is in the, what we call the perimenopause. That is the one to one and a half year before entering menopause. And that's uh, a, a period where uh, estrogen levels in particular are um, both, uh, uh, yeah, vary quite a lot. 
And in menopausal transition, there's also an increased risk of uh, both depressive symptoms, but also clinical levels of depression. And interestingly, uh, the strongest risk factor for such uh, depressive symptoms is actually the amount uh, to which estradiol varies around a woman's own mean. So again, here linking some of these estradiol changes, at least in particular vulnerable subgroups, uh, to development of depressive symptoms. And it's not only depression, it's actually also more uh, profound or deeper psychopathology uh, that can be linked uh, uh, to sex uh, hormone fluctuations. So this is uh, a graph illustrating with the star there that there's a sub-portion of women who, who, who actually get a, a schizophrenia uh, diagnosis uh, uh, right in the perimenopausal uh, years. There's no, no, no male gets a diagnosis almost uh, uh, that late in life. So uh, fortunately, this is really rare, but again, it just highlights that there might be something about sex hormone associated mechanisms that we ought to understand better in, a, in, in order to be able to prevent and maybe treat uh, psychiatric diseases. That at least got me really curious into this subject. So that's why I embarked on this uh, 10 years ago, and I developed uh, a model uh, that I thought might be useful, maybe, you know, it's not perfect, but it might be useful in trying to understand estro estrogen-linked mechanisms that could inform um, uh, this theme. So I sort of uh, worked from epidemiology to neurobiology and tried to ask how does risk and resilience work. So we can do that by, uh, yeah, by designing experimental setups where we can isolate uh, certain uh, mechanisms or phenomena and, and can link them to, to, to other phenomena. But we can also try to look at uh, natural existing models such as uh, yeah, the very clinically relevant uh, population of women who becomes pregnant and give birth and may uh, uh, become depressed. And also some models that are existing in terms of exogenous uh, hormone, hormone um, exposure, such as hormonal contraceptives. And I'll touch upon these different ways to try to study uh, these phenomena. And very importantly, also try to back-translate and translate between these different ways to look at how sex hormone information can be integrated in, in, in brain and, and mental health. So, but the model that I started to work with, <clears throat> uh, um, in that model I was using, or I do use, uh, pharmacologically, pharmacological tools to mani manipulate sex hormone levels. And uh, uh, these tools um, disrupt the normal hormonal rhythms. So what we can do, we can, we can use uh, a compound that actually consecutively stimulate uh, the axis, and that has the consequence that first the axis is stimulated, so first the ovarian hormone production of estrogen and progesterone is increasing for a few days, and then it desensitizes the axis because it's, it's used to pulsatile information. So when it gets, you know, this drone or constant information, it actually desensitizes, and that's how it's, it is downregulated. And so, so this is kind of just a schematic of what, what, what response do we get from this pharmacological tool. So first we get an increase, and then we get a quite deep uh, suppression, which approaches levels or very low levels of ovarian hormones, uh, um, similar to what, what is seen in menopause. And that, uh, uh, we, we can keep that for, for one cycle. So, um, and actually, you know, it's not, it's not that unusual to skip a cycle in a female life. That happens almost, you know, one time a year for us. So, and, and we're using these compounds which are known to be really safe because they're also used in reproductive medicine. So, um, so, so we were quite, um, of course, we were careful, but, but we were quite also quite um, calm with it. And we found this uh, uh, cool group of women who were altruistic, uh, brave, curious enough to want to uh, volunteer for this project. But this is just to show you that um, we include, included these 63 women uh, in a calm place in their cycle here, and then they were assigned to either active sex hormone manipulation or placebo, and they were again um, investigated uh, in, a, in, 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 a, in a phase uh, after the intervention that uh, uh, is similar to the, the the, the, yeah, the transition, the, the early start of the suppression phase, and the placebo group was again entering a calm place in their cycle. So we could compare uh, uh, these groups uh, to each other. 
Uh, and, and one of the domains we're really interested in was this regulatory uh, uh, molecule that uh, changes uh, internal communication in the brain uh, by, by, by serotonin signaling substances. So the yellow cigar here, the break of the system we were imaging. So uh, this is what we published here in this article, and I will, uh, I, I will uh, walk you through it. So first, uh, quite importantly for our model, we could actually elicit some depressive-like symptoms. This is shown in the red dots, where um, on the y-axis we have a measure of uh, depressive symptoms, and we have the placebo group in blue and the active group in red. And what you can see is that most of the women, so the bottom ones, they were actually buffering uh, this intervention quite well and, and did not develop any excess uh, depressive-like symptoms uh, compared to baseline. But there was this upper group of, uh, of women who were actually reaching, uh, approaching clinical levels of depression, of course, for a very short uh, time, which was quite nice. Otherwise, I wouldn't sleep very well at night. Um, but, but yeah, you know, this was transient, but it was still proof of principle that something was happening. So we were quite interested in how these yeah, what, what, what would link, what mechanisms would link to this group of women that, that displayed depressive symptoms? So what we saw was that there was a link to the estradiol decrease, so to the uh, degree to which estradiol was uh, fluctuating with our intervention or was decreasing. Uh, so that was one uh, principal finding. And then also we saw that uh, the women who developed depressive-like symptoms actually had higher levels of the serotonin break or the serotonin transporter after our intervention. So we do believe that maybe they have slightly more compromised serotonergic signaling, which may add to why they develop some depressive-like symptoms. That at least is our hypothesis from this model. And we were interested in trying to look at whether that could be arising from the stimulatory phase, actually. Because we know that these uh, hormones can stimulate uh, gene transcription, and what if they stimulate it gene transcription of the serotonin transporter. We had some rat data from colleagues that showed that. So we wanted to look at our own rats. And, uh, and, and, and you know, you can study rat uh, in a model system resembling um, a cyclic, uh, hormone cycle, cycling brain. Much shorter cycle, but still. And also estradiol is believed to, to affect rat brains. And also uh, we can uh, monitor cycle uh, of a rat by looking at uh, particular patterns uh, of their, actually their skin cells. So, so, so we had the techniques. And what uh, my colleague uh, uh, Agneta Orko showed then was actually that with a direct flare, so a direct manipulation of a rat where we were increasing estradiol, we also saw an increased level of the serotonin transporter. But what was really surprising to us was that it was sustained for a very long time. So if for two cycles, which in a rat is eight days, we still had higher serotonin transporter levels or more break on board in the rat brain when we had been stimulating it. So we do think there might be something there, some risk uh, associated with uh, rises in estradiol in late, late pregnancy maybe, also um, that, that may play a role and may carry over to the postpartum phase. Okay. We were also very interested in other basic systems of the brain uh, which governs reward processing. So these are very basic systems uh, that are kind of built or evolved to support uh, motivation and help us engage in behaviors that support survival. And, uh, and, and, and that is a, a really basic um, functioning of the brain which is also affected in depression. So you can lose motivation, you can lose interest in in other things uh, when you're depressed. We can study that by uh, placing um, individuals in a scanner where they are engaging in cognitive processes that has to do with winning something. So that is a very standard way of doing it. But we do think uh, uh, the system activations would translate uh, to social reward, which is a very uh, uh, strong reward as well. And it's quite clear that that might be super important, especially if, if you get a depressive episode um, in the postpartum because uh, you want to preserve as much maternal capacity and motivation, uh, uh, social interaction, and, uh, and, and caring for, for, for your infant. So if that is affected, it can be, you know, even at a subclinical level, maybe uh, not so good and, and something that we need to treat. So what we saw in our model system was uh, a little bit scary. So we actually saw that uh, the 
sex hormone manipulated women was engaging less in positive stimuli. That is shown here in parts of the reward system in blue at, at, at the brain scan, scan uh, panel. And that was um, compared to placebo. So uh, we are quite keen and interested in seeing if this translates to the clinically relevant groups of, of depressed women uh, postpartum. We don't know yet, that yet. Okay, we also saw this uh, plastic uh, area, the hippocampal area in the brain, being uh, kind of shut off from other communication with other brain areas uh, in a way that was associated with these depressive symptoms. So this is an other line of evidence supporting that there may be some uh, mechanisms also linked to hippocampal plasticity that play a role in this sex hormone manipulation triggered depressive symptoms. Okay, something that we were also really interested in uh, uh, was to look at whether we could have some biomarkers that would explain uh, uh, who were more sensitive to developing depressive episodes in sex hormone manipulation setups or transitions than others. And we were looking uh, to translate some findings from some colleagues of ours who had been looking at um, special patterns of uh, gene transcript profiles. So this is uh, kind of markers for uh, how the genes listen to hormones or how the genes are used. And, and, and they were seeing a pattern uh, where they were suggesting that there might be some estrogen sensitivity going on. So they were seeing differences in how the genes were uh, uh, being transcribed in late pregnancy in women who later developed depressive epi uh, episodes. And, uh, of course, they couldn't really assign it to estrogen because there's lots of things going on when you're pregnant and also uh, when you become a new mother. But, but that was their theory from looking at which gene transcripts were, were, were differentially uh, uh, expressed. So we were offering our data set and trying to back-translate their findings. And actually, it became... Uh, um, I was very nervous <laughs> because I thought, you know, then I was contacting these uh, nice colleagues and what if, you know, our data set was too small or we didn't uh, see anything or it was become inconclusive. But actually, we could see that we could um, translate uh, their patterns. So we do start to believe and we need to test further if we have now some ways where we can maybe try to identify uh, the women that are more hormone sensitive. And that's the, uh, yeah, and also we want to embark on, 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 on clinical translations uh, of, 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 of these insights, uh, since uh, that is something that is, of course, very important uh, for us as doctors to be able to use the knowledge that we produce and to test also if it fails, of course, to test if it can be used in clinical settings. So that is what we're doing now in the study called the MAMA study. And the logical uh, question there from our model uh, insights is whether short-term estradiol patch uh, can prevent perinatal or postpartum depression in a high-risk group of women who have had uh, in earlier pregnancies a depressive episodes and are now pregnant again. So the idea here being uh, to <clears throat> try to support neuroprotection, for instance, the hippocampal plasticity um, resources by, uh, by, by, by by having a less steep decline in estradiol postpartum. That is one aspect that we thought uh, would be intervenable. And uh, I'd like to highlight Stine and Annika and Mede, who work really hard in collecting this data set. So, uh, a very natural question is, <clears throat> how come that, uh, that, that, you know, uh, we know <laughs> yeah, that some of us tolerate this uh, pregnancy changes and postpartum really well? So. Uh, Naturally, uh, in an evolutionary perspective, it's quite clear that the majority of women benefits brain-wise from, uh, from, from all these uh, very potent things that can happen in pregnancy and the postpartum. It's illustrated here in a very uh, elegant study uh, that followed women, primo paris, women, so women getting pregnant for the first time from before pregnancy and up to two years after. And, what was, uh, and they were healthy. And what was quite clear was that uh, they were um, rebuilding their brains. So uh, these brain areas uh, were becoming um, different, were, were structurally remodeled in ways we think are functionally uh, good, uh, reorganizes uh, their brains and makes them uh, function better. And the areas that were uh, mostly rebuilt totally resemble areas that we know can be important for empathy. And we think that this rebuilding might actually carry 
uh, some information that the brain can be rebuilt in a way that can prepare us for motherhood. So it is, uh, yeah, these areas that are known to be um, uh, active when we are engaged in, in empathy, like uh, cognition, or trying to understand ourselves or seeing ourselves in the other. Uh, also, they could show that um, uh, the degree to which these uh, areas of the brain was remodeled or reorganized actually was associated with other measures, psychological me measures of infant to mother attachment. So that was, uh, um, you know, supposedly has to do with some function that is important for maternal capacity. So that is um, uh, quite important information, I think. Uh, also, uh, something similar goes on in the adolescent brain or in the teenage years through puberty, probably also driven in part at least by, uh, by hormonal processes. And I think this is quite uh, important to acknowledge. So what we see here is that the blue and the red kind of patterns uh, shows that uh, brain maturation or reorganization through pregnancy and adolescence are very similar. So these are uh, uh, principal phenomena that uh, represent uh, restructuring of the brain, that is total brain volume, cortical volumes, etc. And this is just much more flat in the female controls who are not adolescents, adolescent or uh, uh, going through pregnancy. So I think this really highlights that uh, it's a very critical period in teenage life and uh, that teenagers really need to be soaked in very positive and stimulating environments uh, to fully develop uh, their potentials and um, can be challenging but still supportive. And, uh, and I actually have been thinking a little bit about that uh, during now our COVID crisis where I think, you know, I don't believe in our teenagers as the big victims necessarily. I think they can learn a lot also from going through a crisis. But on the other hand, I just hope that we can maybe embrace and tolerate more now that they really uh, need to catch up uh, because there has been quite a bit of social deprivation and, you know, they're in a hurry. Their brains are really developing now and they need all these experiences. Okay, then uh, to our other model, which is the uh, exogenous uh, hormonal um, exposures that uh, very many women um, uh, use oral contraceptives. And there are many good things to say about oral contraceptives. I truly believe that it can protect us against uh, unwanted pregnancies. Uh, teenage pregnancies have helped in a historical perspective liberate women, make women more independent. And also there has been, uh, you know, uh, always acknowledgement of uh, certain subgroups of women who cannot tolerate oral contraceptives very well, maybe because they have an increased risk of uh, Trump embolic events, which can be blood clots in the vein systems or more severe in the lungs. But there has been less uh, attention to uh, um, psychological uh, side effects. But that, is, has trying to, uh, that has started now to, um, to develop uh, also with uh, Danish data. So uh, it's quite clear now and replicated quite strongly in independent cohorts that there is an increased risk of uh, getting treated with a depressive episode uh, in, in, in a period of time quite close to when you started an oral contraceptive. And that is actually most prominent in adolescence, which is also, you know, thinking about uh, an unfinished, unmatured brain getting disrupted within its hormonal systems, maybe, you know, it's, yeah, quite a good question why. Uh, and, 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 and if adolescent uh, girls tolerate pill, the pill uh, as well as more adult, um, adult women. But, but anyway, most of the women tolerate it well, but there are some that cannot tolerate it, and we like to understand why. And we uh, tried to use uh, available data first, and later we embarked uh, now in some experimental studies, but first we wanted to see what we have. And we've built a database um, of um, healthy controls that has very careful, uh, carefully been phenotyped and also brain scanned. And this was together with Søren Larsen, who is now a PhD student, and he was at that time a medical student, wanting to, uh, to, to, to participate in some scientific work, which turned out to be really fruitful. And um, yeah, we could look at, we could compare women who were healthy and used oral contraceptives with women uh, who did not use uh, oral contraceptives and the groups were uh, otherwise comparable. And what we could see was in this mid-panel mid here, I don't know if you can acknowledge that it's more pale, it has le less red colors. 
So these were women who use uh, oral contraceptives, and we image an important receptor, which is called the serotonin-4 receptor, sits very much in the reward system, and they simply had less of that compared to non-users. And, you know, they were healthy, so they probably tolerated it quite well. In the pink there is just a subtraction image, so that is showing the difference. Um, and that's quite a huge difference. It's actually um, quite... Yeah, it's actually double the size of what we can introduce with an antidepressant, which we have also been experimenting with giving to healthy volunteers because we wanted to see how that affects their brains. So, so, you know, we were thinking that maybe uh, if they would um, run into another bump on the road, another risk factor that could uh, trigger a depressive episode, then it might not be so good to, 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 to be, you know, remodeled like that. And that, but that's of course something we don't know yet. But it is a plausible mechanism that can explain by, uh, uh, why some might um, develop depressive episodes. So uh, just hang on for a moment. This is uh, yeah, some of the last data I'll be showing you. I just wanted to illustrate to you how this female brain on her oral contraceptives shares some patterns or some, some features with a depressed brain. So this is another data set. And all the colored uh, dots, the green, the blue, the red, are depressed patients compared to the gray, which are controls. And, and, and they've been imaged with the same receptor that I just showed you uh, in the other study. So here, the, uh, the hormonal contraceptive users were low in their uh, expression or their uh, levels of serotonin-4 receptors and looked a little bit more like a depressed state patient than healthy controls. But they're healthy, right? So we are thinking, you know, and we want to ask questions about, okay, if you are a woman who uses an oral contraceptive, and that, that went fine for a few years, then you bump into some thing and you develop a depressive episode, then what, you, what is most antidepressant? Would it be antidepressant to take and taper off the hormonal contraceptives? We don't know. We don't even know if it's fast enough. And, and we don't know. Maybe you need just the usual treatments. But these are important questions uh, that uh, are important to many women. This is uh, uh, yeah, some data I want to show you uh, about how we think also that the serotonin signaling system is, is involved in um, yeah, risk mechanisms in, uh, in perimenopause uh, that can be linked to estradiol as well. So, uh, uh, yeah, uh, earlier data have shown that in menopause, if you use an estrogen replacement, that could be a patch. <clears throat> actually you're able to uh, increase uh, some uh, important receptors in the system by, you know, a very large uh, uh, number there, 35, 30, 40 percent. And this may be quite uh, important uh, also um, for novel targets uh, treating depression in, um, in these um, phases of life. And there has been done some attempts to look at uh, protection of, uh, de of, uh, of mental health with estradiol patch use. And it's quite clear that um, uh, using an estradiol patch uh, in pure menopause uh, protects uh, women against depressive episodes. This is depressive episodes compared to placebo. However, we don't know if all these women would need that. It would be nice if we could know more about or use some of our candidate biomarkers or other markers to you know, be, be able to, more di to, to, in a more clever way, direct our patches to the women that actually needs them in order to, to not develop depressive episode in this period. So uh, we hope to also to be able to contribute with some of that. Yeah, this is just to show you that, uh, uh, of course, I'm not only interested in uh, half of the population. I also think that these uh, uh, understanding better these uh, sex hormone effects on the brain is also important to the male brain. So, uh, just if you didn't know, males also have quite uh, some um, yeah, uh, uh, non-negligible levels of estradiol, and it's also clearly associated with their receptor systems for, uh, for, for uh, serotonin. And testosterone, in many ways, are precursors for uh, estradiol since it's converted in the brain locally. So, so you know, these, these mechanisms are important to all of us. I'll allude a little bit to uh, how uh, this knowledge uh, is important for novel antidepressant or cross-diagnostic uh, targets. I've already mentioned uh, the question if, if we should, in some instances, be tapering off hormonal contraceptives in depressed states or 
maybe not do it. I mean, uh, let uh, women have their, their, their favorite uh, um, contraceptives. Uh, it would be nice to understand better if, 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 it, if it means something. Also in development are allopregnanolone analogs, that is uh, metabolites of uh, steroid hormones that uh, uh, may have some potential uh, to be used as antidepressants. Uh, also in the postpartum, but also in other uh, f uh, um, phases in life. Also, we uh, can experiment with estradiol augmented treatments that can be short-term augmentation. For instance, in psychotherapy, uh, where we want to do fear extinction, for instance, in anxiety disorders. It has been shown that it might be quite important, at least in uh, menopausal states, to, uh, to support with estradiol, enable to be able to rebuild uh, these brain systems that has become... Um, also, uh, this very new compound, compound that has elicited a lot of hope and uh, cautious optimism, psilocybin, which is a hallucinogenic, uh, and it, uh, it seems that uh, even one, two, or very few exposures to psilocybin, in some instances, can actually um, reset the brain in some antidepressant way. And, and that is, of course, extremely important to understand better and to know how to direct to the right segments of depressed patients, um, since we don't only want to be able to, cha to, to treat the believers and who the, 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 the people that are brave enough and positive and optimistic enough to engage in these very experimental or somehow in experimental treatments, because depressed people are often, very often, not very brave and not very optimistic. So we, we really need to, to understand this better, and we also need to understand how maybe uh, uh, the sex steroid hormone settings uh, may, f may, may, may mean something about how psilocybin can work, because it works through this 2A receptor that I just showed you is extremely sensitive to, to, to estradiol. So these are also important questions. And um, yeah, this is to show you uh, the system where we think that uh, psilocybin may work. So um, yeah, uh, in normal brain function, we use a lot of time cognitive time not engaging in any goal-oriented activity. And when we do that, we mind wander, or we use our default mode network, which is depicted here. Um, and and, and this, that is kind of self-referential thought. It could be envisioning uh, the future, uh, reviewing the past, uh, seeing yourself in the others, things like that. And that is uh, cognitive processes that are really disturbed and very rigid and negatively biased in the depressed state. So you you, yeah, you, you often think very pessimistic about the future, you remember your past really negatively and uh, cannot really engage uh, in outward uh, uh, environments or in the other. So, uh, so, so um, yeah, so, so that's uh, where we think uh, psilocybin might work. And we think that it may be quite important how the serotonin 2A receptor is set to be able to use uh, those treatments. Okay, so conclusion and, um, yeah, so I think I've uh, uh, tried to show you at least uh, how sex hormone transitions profoundly reshape our brains and that transitions rather than suppressed hormone states uh, per se trigger depressive-like symptoms in some, but uh, uh, very importantly, not all women. Also, estrogen sensitivity and brain-based uh, mechanisms, uh, I've shown you that they play a role. And uh, I tried to illustrate that uh, model systems or pharmacological manipulation and also natural existing human models are useful for understanding these risk and resilience uh, mechanisms in brain architecture. So my last slide, why am I excited? I think this is, a, yeah, you know, it's a good question at least for me to ask myself. But, you know, I'm excited since, since I think that as continuing studying these hormonal rhythms uh, may allow us to directly eliminate targetable, and that's important, we need to understand mechanisms that we can also target, uh, risk and robustness uh, mechanisms, um, and use that to inform stratified personalized medicine approach to protect mental health. And I think that holds great promise uh, to protect brain health from infant to adult life, for instance, in the example of being able to prevent depressive episodes uh, for a new, new mother, because it will also protect her infant. And also, I maybe naively uh, hope that uh, biology may help uh, if interpreted in the right way and communicated in the right way to fight stigma. So I hope that uh, 
patients who may be uh, offered some more knowledge on uh, how these uh, systems um, at a biological level also affect risk and, and resilience may help reduce shame and guilt issues and also may uh, help uh, lower the threshold for accepting preventive treatments and also uh, yeah, a treatment in disease states. Uh, however, that's not something that we know. It may be that, you know, identifying high-risk groups also carries some uh, risk of uh, thinking very negatively about yourself. So we really need to understand these, uh, you know, self-understanding perspectives much better as well. And we are, uh, that's why we are collaborating with a nice anthropologist to try to uh, also get some information that can help us understand this better. Okay, very importantly, I want to thank all the people who I uh, have collaborated with and who supports all this uh, work and the great infrastructure at Neurobiology Research Unit. I want to thank my uh, smaller group, the Imaging Psychiatry, Psychiatry Group. And uh, there are lots of people to thank, but I just like this picture so much, so I want to uh, highlight Camilla, Luna, and Emma, who is here scanning a mom and uh, taking uh, great care of uh, her infant, who is about, I think, five or eight weeks old. That is possible. Um, and I also want to uh, highlight um, my number one uh, role model and mentor, Gide Moos Knudsen, who is professor at Neurobiology Research Unit, and uh, lots of other important uh, collaborators. And I'll thank you for your attention. <laughs>